Hey everyone, thank you so much for tuning in and supporting my show. Uh, I am thrilled for recording this episode with uh, someone who I really met on LinkedIn and I'm so thankful that he agreed to do this episode. But before I do an introduction, really quick, I'm again super thrilled to join forces with OffsiteDirt.com and bring forth all these diverse voices, leaders in lean construction. For all of you, we are bringing their valuable experiences, expertise directly to you. And my goal is to equip you with the actionable takeaways that you can take and implement in your everyday work life. So join me and make the most of your time. I don't know where you at. I don't know which time zone you're at, but I either you're uh, sitting on your couch or you're take, you're in commuting somewhere or you're enjoying a cup of coffee. I'm super thankful for you to listen in and I'm super excited to bring this episode with you. Uh, please join me in welcoming Adam Foods. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this episode with me with literally one reach out. I know you are massive, massive out there. And uh, the fact that you are literally looking at um, LinkedIn messages and responding and agreeing, uh, it means a lot. Uh, a quick intro, and I'm going to keep it short because I really can't wait for you all to listen and myself too, to listen to Adam's story and how did he come into construction and all the cool things that he has done. He uh, began his career in construction con uh, industry as a plumber. And since it's just been grown uh, after that uh, to now him actually writing a book, which I'm super excited to share more about and, uh, um, you know, uh, consulting for uh, and bringing more awareness about uh, the whole uh, tact concept. So he's a tact master. Over the past 20 years, he has steadily advanced his career and has held a variety of roles in this industry. He has successfully completed more than $1.5 billion in free construction and construction services for many industries, healthcare and higher education, industrial, life sciences. So plethora of different industries that he has worked for and um, uh, some of his many achievements include lean construction coaching he's a lean construction coaching professional he's green globe certified lead accredited um, tact master as i said a scrum master i can go and on and on and on but i'll let him speak more about his journey it's super inspiring i am looking forward to learn more and I am sure you all are going to uh, benefit a lot from this conversation. So welcome, Adam. And let's get started with just a quick intro about you. How did you fall into construction? Was this a childhood dream? To tell us about your journey uh, so far. Yes, Sneha. Well, thank you for having me, first off. And happy new year, right? Isn't this like the new year episode? Absolutely. Uh, happy, happy new year, everyone. So I'm fired up to be like the first guest for this new year, this new season here. Um, and yeah, I'm just just happy to be here with you uh, to to be on this episode. And like you said, we connected via LinkedIn. And so just to get to know you even a little bit beforehand was was pretty awesome. And I look forward to learning more with you in the future. So that I mean, um, so again, thank you for having me on the show. Uh, as you said, I am Adam Hoots. Uh, I started my career when I was 17. Uh, my father works for Whiting Turner, still works with Whiting Turner. He's a senior superintendent down in Orlando, does pretty much all of their Disney World work. Um, he thought it was going to be funny to make me a plumber. Uh, <laughs> actually, let me rewind it. Actually, I got a birthday gift for my 17th birthday and inside was like a stack of job applications at the very bottom. And then there were a pair of boots on top of that with a hard hat and a vest and everything I needed to be safe on a construction site. So my dad thought it was pretty funny that I picked plumbing. Um, he, uh, it was, it was just, uh, it was entertaining to him. Right. And I didn't have any idea what that meant until years later, now that I'm reflecting on it, like, yeah, I stood in some pretty nasty ditches. I did some pretty nasty work. In fact, that actually laid the foundation for, my care, my why, like in the industry and, and to really bring respect to those people who are working in the trades, right? Because right now they're not valued. Society doesn't value them. The workers on the, the, the supervisors don't value them. The owners of the building, the designers don't value them. They don't even value themselves a lot of times. And 
that's a problem, right? And that's something I recognized early on and actually drove me out of the industry, went to school, uh, and then joined Whiting Turner in Tampa. I uh, traveled the country building clean rooms and labs. I was a part of some really cool projects. Uh, and so was fortunate to learn a lot under Chris Woods over at Whiting Turner. Uh, that guy is just a, a project manager genius. We'll just put it that way. Um, so I, I moved all over the country for 13 years. And then we fell in love with this Greenville region. Uh, and my wife said we want our kids to be raised here. They were about eight, nine years old, somewhere in there. They started getting good friends. And so we said, no more. We're going to stay here. So I switched from Whiting Turner to DPR. DPR was local. Um, I did some work at BMW, uh, to which they said, I don't care about your CPM schedule. I want a tact plan. And I said, what is this tact plan stuff you talk of? Uh, I'm up for learning it. And so Charlie Dunn and I got the opportunity to uh, learn TAC planning together on that job. Uh, and then really, you know, ran a CPM in parallel because I didn't trust it at all. Um, we were working in 12 different areas at once and I had a really good team, so you can't discount that. Uh, but the TAC, you know, the TAC time definitely worked on that project and I became a believer in, um, and, so yeah, I've been my whole career really just experimenting. From there, I went to Langston, small smaller contractor mm -hmm. uh, here local, and opened my own coaching business. Um, and then yeah, I just you know trying to make a difference in any way we can because this industry is you know such a broken system uh, that a lot of people are living in and they have no control over yeah. how to fix it. And so I've seen the industry from a few different angles. Um, and I, I feel like, again, I can't quite, like, there are some changes in, in, in just the mindsets on the job site. If we could just make those, the system of construction would be a much better place and I can see it. Um, and I'm also currently a PhD student, uh, and professor at Clemson. So I teach uh, a couple of different classes out there. Um, and just trying to contribute to the overall knowledge of construction to, to make it a better place to work. Because quite honestly, there are some project sites out there. I will even say the majority of project sites out there suck to work on. And if that offended you, good, because it's probably your job that sucks. So, uh, yeah, that's me, Sneha. I hope, uh, I hope I didn't offend you. Oh, no, absolutely. I think, uh, thank you for bringing uh, the focus back on what reality looks like. And let's be, let's be real. Let's be honest. Um, yes, we have some really great job sites, some really bigger companies, really putting the focus on employees, on job sites, on bringing diverse groups in and also on lean. Yet at the same time, I myself have worked with some smaller construction folks where as a woman as a woman of color I have seen the bias I have seen the and when I say bias it's also about the job site it's also about being inclusive for women and how are you making it safe and how are you making it uh uh, uh you know a conducive environment for for every person coming in and being able to enjoy that and then passing on to the Gen Z's of our generation. Like, how do we make it more appealing? We need new voices. We need innovation in, in our industry. So yes, we all should be accepting. And probably if we are at a job site today, if any of my listeners are, let's look around and see what changes can be made. So thank you. I would absolutely love to chat a little bit about your journey on the book and also the nonprofit. Adam, I really want our listeners to uh, tune into that and um, uh, learn more about that. Yeah, so I have uh, fought kidney disease my almost my entire life. I was 17 in high school. About Maybe this has something to do with plumbing now that I think about it. Uh, but I was 17, got a high school physical. I was like a fantastic student athlete in high school. Um, I went to college on the hopes of playing uh, D1 football, 
never really came true, um, but I gave it heck. So I was a really good athlete. Went for a physical my senior year. They told me I had high blood pressure. Fast forward a couple of tests later, it turned out I had a kidney disease. I've also passed over 100 kidney stones in my day. So lots of kidney, uh, all my filters were scar tissued up and they basically just stopped working. Wow. I was on dialysis for almost two years. And then my mother gave me a kidney back in 2014. Um, was good for about nine and a half years. And then everything just went downhill quick. Um, that kidney failed me was on dialysis for another nine months uh, and then got a transplant actually eight weeks ago. And so I have battled kidney failure uh, a couple of times and it's rough um, being on dialysis, being tethered to a machine is a really, really rough life. And so the first time I went through that, we opened up a not-for-profit called Kidsney. Uh, it's K-I-D-S-N-E-Y, right? Because we were more focused on the kids that are dealing with kidney disease. Um, and we would just go to the hospital and play video games or take them to basketball games and just hang out while they were on dialysis and uh, they were getting their blood cleaned. And so uh, it's rough, right? If, for those of you that don't know, it's generally three days a week, four hours a day. You're going to a center, you're getting all your blood taken out of your body, put through a filter and then put back into you. Um, and it causes blood pressure issues and you get sick and headaches and blot like it's, and there's blood and blood wants to clot. And when blood clots, the machine beeps because there's occlusions and it just like, it's not, you talk about conducive environments. It reminds me of a job site. Once you get comfortable, boom, the alarm starts going off or the, your, you, your blood pressure drops and you feel sick. like there's always something, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and so, and then the other one is to do it at home, which is called peritoneal. Um, and so in, in you fill your belly with fluid, it dwells there for about an hour and a half to two hours. And then you drain the fluids, which will take toxins and excess fluids with it. So there's a couple of different ways to do it, but both ways are, you're really tethered to a machine. You're not like you, you can't get up and go. Um, and so it's not a very pleasant life. Mm -hmm. And so we created kids knee as a way to, um, and actually we sell these bracelets, right? They're crosses. Uh, and that's how you can identify my people. Uh, mm -hmm. so I'll have to send you one again, uh -huh. um, more so to, to just let mm -hmm. people know, um, you know, I'm having a good day. I'm sending my good vibes and spirits yes. out to the world, or I can turn it around and have it facing me to where it's bringing me good vibes when I need it. Right. Good day, bad day stuff. And so, um, yeah, that's, again, yeah. that, that's really the purpose is to just spread awareness, right? There's a yes. hundred thousand people in the U S who are on the kidney donation list. And there's like, uh, 600 million people in the U S something like that, maybe more, maybe less. So we could easily end the need for kidneys out there and you can live with one kidney. So it's not a big deal. Um, but, you know, again, it's there are people suffering out there that need help and yeah. it's our job to serve those people. So um, big in the kidney community, love the National Kidney Foundation. They're doing awesome things. There's also the Artificial Kidney pro Project out there. Mm -hmm. uh, University of California is leading the charges of, on an implantable filter that can mm -hmm. actually filter your blood inside your body. Mm -hmm. um, it's having troubles getting it to stay in. The body just wants to reject it. Uh, and so... Yeah. Um, I'm excited for the future there. I'm super optimistic. I think there's going to be pretty special things happening. I just love the medical community when they are able to uh, innovate, right. And come up with solutions to problems, not just answers to symptoms. So um, yeah, that, and then what was the other thing? Oh, the book. Yes. yes. Please. So recently co-authored a book with Buddy Brumley, who's a senior superintendent out of Dallas with Skiles Group. Uh, it's called the old dog lean thesaurus uh, and miss Jen Lacey and her daughter, Alex illustrated the book. You can see. Um, I know Jen Lacey. I mean, you? I'm connected with her. Yeah. Oh, she's awesome. She hasn't her. been on the show yet. No, I haven't spoken with her. Do me an introduction. Do me a favor. I follow oh, yeah. her. I love her content. A hundred percent. She's yeah. She's next level. Um, I love fact, her. She's, 
Yeah, she yes, I can't say enough good things. I've stolen so much of her stuff. <laughs> Can I get an autographed copy of this? I want to buy this. Yeah, 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 of course. In but fact, I want but I want a signed, signed copy. I've got one signed by all four of us that will Oh, I want that. To you. Yeah, absolutely. Um okay. an all-star like you, you better believe it. Um 100%. Uh so yes, yeah, so the book basically takes 31 lean terms and it defines them from an old dog perspective, which is Buddy Brumley, who's been in the industry for 40 plus years. And he's actually converted from traditional way of doing things to a lean way of doing things. Uh, and then unfortunately, I got coined as the lean geek. So <laughs> it's also, uh, and you can see how we've done it, right? The terms, um, maybe you can, maybe you can't. I can. Conditions of satisfaction, buffers. And you've got a dog in the upper left-hand corner. And yes. so that's the conditions of satisfaction as understood by the old dog. And then if you want to understand it from a lean geek, you can read it from that perspective as well. Um, I and so I just, the book came from, you know, there's a lot of bullshito in the lean construction world where people are um, using these fancy words for things that some of these old dogs have been doing for a long time. And so the point is, you know, I don't care what you call it, right? Like people get so hung up on that. It's more important that we do it and mm -hmm. we get better. And if anybody in this world is going to argue with just getting better, then they're doing life wrong. Right? <laughs> like, um, and, and, and so again, the whole purpose is to just make lean simple uh, and show, give you stories on how we have used some of these words like conditions of satisfaction on a job or buffers or eight ways and what are the eight ways and um you know it's more than just memorizing downtime for you bullshito artists out there right it's not that it's understanding which ones cause the other ones and how to get to root causes of, of fixing them and so again all of this stuff we explored in here and i i we've gotten great feedback from it um just our ability to make it simple and funny right there's stories in there that's just like you know, if you're going to learn lean with me and buddy, you better believe we're going to have a good time while we do it. Wow. Oh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to reading this book. Thank you so much for sharing this. And thank you for offering me a signed copy, but our listeners go check out the book, see um, uh, if you can buy it and actually take some, it's a pretty thin book. If you saw it, it's like, you can quickly go through it and use it like a guide. Like you don't have to go through it at once. You know, if it's explaining, use it at a guide and, you know, slowly get through it. I think it's a process. It's always a process read it, learn it, use it, implement it, and then go back to it. Absolutely. And it's bigger than just a book too, because we've had a group of old dog superintendents together on a lean coffee once a month for two years now. Wow. And we've developed yep. well, kind of this old dog lean community. And the greatest part about it is they all work for different companies. There's, you know, all of the major companies represented some smaller, like it is just, it's, it's a, melting pot of magic happening where somebody brings an issue and there's six different people that said i dealt with it this way and uh and there's other like buddy and i have huge things planned for that community so definitely buy the book but more importantly like if you want to become part of it what we're doing come reach out join us we want to we want to really bridge that gap that exists between the old dogs that are retiring. And now again, an old dog doesn't always mean old person, right? Old dog is just a way of thinking. It's that lean mindset that I'm going to get it done. I'm going to figure out a way and we're going to make it happen. Um, and so we want to bridge that mind, that, that knowledge gap from the old dogs that have it and to the new people that are coming into the industry that are trying to figure it out. And, and there's a huge gap there that we all recognize but not many are doing anything about it. And we've got some things that we want to do to, to solve that. Awesome. Awesome. Well, you know, super inspiring your journey, what you're doing with everything that you're handling. You know, a lot of times, you know, we meet people virtually and you really don't know what kind of day you are having, um, right? Or what you're going through while putting up a smile or, you know, sharing the wealth of the knowledge you have. So, Really, like, kudos to you for doing what you're doing. Thank you for showing up every day for the community that you're building, for people, for the cause that you believe in, and for the book. 
Thanks so much. Um, I do want to get into one project that if you can share, I know you have, you might have had many of such projects because of your industry, diverse industry experiences, but pick one. I know it's hard, but pick one and share it with the viewers. I would like them to take away some of the key learnings that you had or you overcame that probably some of um, our listeners can actually take back and, you know, uh, implement in their day-to-day uh, lives. Okay, I'm going to give it to you, um, but they're going to have to extract the lessons for themselves based on my mess ups. How's that sound? Yes, I think that's perfect. Okay, so uh, it's a higher education. I'd rather. So my whole thesis is based on this, actually, Um, and and it's a higher education project. I'd rather not give you the name of the project or the company I worked for, because the way we tried to implement lean construction on that project was an utter failure. Um, and it was uh, just awful from, from the way we ran pool meetings to not having daily huddle meetings to, I remember this one time we were in a meeting and it was a weekly work planning meeting and we were trying to calculate, are you done or are you not done? Right. The PPC, right because you got a 60% last week and that's terrible. And what are you doing? And like totally weaponizing that metric. Um, Again, lesson learned, ding. Uh, I wish I had like a sound effect for, uh, I bet you I could. I wish I had that sound effect. Ready? Lesson learned, right? So the first thing I was actually told, Hoots, you are going to be the lean champion on this project. So go learn all you can and then take it to your job and implement it. That can't happen, right? The project team has to want it. Um, So I went out and I read all the white papers and I was like bound and determined that we're gonna do everything per exactly like the white papers. Well, guess what? James Glass once told me, and he's a superintendent for Turner. He told me, you can't take the project and make the project fit lean. You have to take lean and make lean fit the project. And so you don't have to go by the rules. Um, But I remember this time we were in this uh, weekly work planning meeting, trying to calculate the PPC that I was eventually going to weaponize. And I was just sick of it. I was like, you know, I'm asking the drywall guy, hey, did you get the walls framed on level three of area D? He's like, nope, can't. The plumber's, plumber's in my way. And I was like, okay, plumber, like, when are you going to have all of your holes done, core drilled, so that the framer can go out there and frame the walls? Well, I'm just waiting on the framer. And I was like, golly, enough. And I, like, took, like, classic, traditional hard hat at the wall. Let's go to the field. I took them out there, and we walked over to building D, level three. We walked up the, the stairs, and I will never forget the plumber's like, come on, come with me. Like, I'll show you right where it is. And I walk over there and the wall's not there. Right. And so I'm like, okay. Uh, it, the wall wasn't laid out. And so, um, I'm like, well, like you just lied to me. And he's like, oh yeah, we'll come over here. We went to the other side of the hallway and none of the core drills were done. And so they were both telling me the truth, but one was on one side of the hallway and the other was on the other side of the hallway. And so this was before the time I learned about small batches and flow and how we move through spaces with trade flow and workflow and we consider logistical flow and all of these things that um, now just seem like common sense but then it was like oh yeah you're right like you're both waiting on each other on the floor and no wonder anything's getting not getting done because we didn't go out to the field and look at the work that was taking place in the specific spot that it needed to get done and when we did that boom it was done and it cleared. From that point on, I kind of shifted to, um, you know, it wasn't all about kind of the post-it notes up there, right? It was more about, hey, this relationship of let's go and see, let's talk, let's build trust, let's count on one another. That stuff really started to change. And unfortunately, it was kind of at the end of this project. Um, But, you know, again, we didn't have visuals right like all we did was visualize our plan with sticky notes on a three-week look ahead we didn't have a roadblock board we didn't have a parking lot we didn't have delivery boards like we just didn't do all those things we also tried to take the whole system and implement it all at once in lieu of like that lean builder way of 
They just start with daily huddles, then hang some pictures on the wall, then maybe get your three weeks, then start your like there's there's steps and stages and you don't have to do it all all at once. Right. Make the project. I'm sorry, make lean fit the project. Um, you can customize it. Um, but I think the biggest change was really uh, the next job moving forward from there when we really started building trust before we started doing any of this stuff. That was a game changer for me, especially looking back. Like that's something we didn't do on this higher education project whatsoever was focus on the, Hey, for five minutes before this meeting starts, just like we did before the podcast starts, like, I just want to get to know you because I care about you as a person and you're important to me. And when you, when you, like, when you do that in lieu of just diving right into the work activities, oh, the magic really starts flowing because then that other person becomes a fan and wants to help you. So um, yeah, again, lots of lessons learned there. Um, most importantly was how to develop trust with people such that it's deeper than just the sticky notes on the wall. I love it. I love everything that you said, going to Gemba, what you just said to exactly see what, what happened, right? Diving you said in. the G word, not me. <laughs> you uh, actually uh, uh, diving deep and understanding what's going on but trust oh my god I think that's a big piece of bringing all these puzzles of lean together and actually making it happen I always say that go j just a little more beyond asking how are you care about the answer to that question I think we just say hey how are you and then move on care about that a little bit more it matters yeah that's that's water skiing in conversations and most people are just quite happy staying on the surface and just giving you enough to suffice you and shut you up yeah. but when you meet that person who's like "Ooh, you're just okay why is that or well you don't look like you're good like yeah. when you can ask the next question based on the response you got trust is being okay. built <laughs> changes it also changes the perspective and actually reception of how you say probably as a consultant coming in and building that trust with the folks out there even a person who is trying to implement lean as a leader as a superintendent as whoever vp operations manager build that trust with people and they will give you what you want and only then will lean implementation be successful like this is the most important and very often ignored uh, aspect of lean unfortunately yeah well i mean again i start all my meetings with an icebreaker whether that's brags or drags or what food don't you like or hey somebody asked somebody a random question like and i look weird the first like four times i do it people are like oh, this guy again but the fifth time when somebody else comes in with that idea or the sixth time when it's like, oh, OK, like I got somewhere and this person connected to that, it becomes all worth it. And all of a sudden you're not the weird person. It's the person who doesn't want to participate who looks weird. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing uh, these these nuggets with us. One question before, like one well, last question I did have for you was what are the latest trends you're watching out in this industry? Uh, and keeping an eye on that you would like to share with us? Yeah, so um, kind of high level picture, I think uh, mental health and construction is huge. Uh, we all need to start paying better attention to that. And just being more kind, I think, uh, could go a long way at combating that. Um, right? Like, don't walk past any worker on your project site without at a minimum smiling and engaging like from an eye contact perspective, that's a minimum requirement. At most get to know them in their children's names and what food they don't like. Um, so I, I think that's a huge part of it that uh, the, the workforce shortage is kind of driving the need to make that important. Um, I also see the, the value of people is starting to change right like society is kind of going away from the four-year degree model which is i wouldn't say is good or bad i just think we need balance of both um i, I definitely think tact planning is coming uh and it's not stopping when we can figure out how to work in small batches and how to balance our workflow 
uh, we are going to start respecting the production laws, the four production laws a lot better. Um, and so tact planning is most certainly it. And lean, I hate to tell people, again, I don't care if you call it that, but it's not, it's not a buzzword. It's not a fad. It's not going away. Call it total quality management. Whatever. Uh, thinking, call it continuous improvement. This getting better thing is important to us as people in humanity. It's evolution. So get with the program. Oh my, you just ended it in the perfect way. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for talking about mental health. One of my episodes will be talking about that. Um, so I hope to bring more awareness. I'm far more aware about the statistics happening in construction and that relating to mental health. I think we have very little awareness of that. It needs to be, people need to be aware of it. And there needs to be programs that address those with our employees. And yes, at a minimum, please smile. Folks, on the job site, smile. That's what we can do. It's free. Yes, absolutely. And it, it does leave an impact. Anyways, that's all for my listeners. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much, Adam, for being on the show. And uh, absolutely go check him out on LinkedIn. Check his book out. I am telling you, you're going to make the most of your work life by just listening and following him uh, and his posts. All right. Thank you, everyone. I hope you have a great day, evening, weekend, week, wherever you are at. Thank you so much for listening to this. Bye.